Hey, Dr. Segrin here. And today I'm actually going to switch it up a little bit and talk about uh, coronavirus or COVID. Uh, and the reason for that is that, you know, I think it's important for pretty much everybody in the world to know a decent amount about this virus, judging that it's going to be with us for some time and has been with us for some time already. It has already caused a lot of damage in the world. There's a lot of misinformation out there about it. Uh, so I thought I would just give a, a nice summary of what I would consider kind of everything you need to know about uh, COVID and the coronavirus. I've already recorded, I think, close to six hours about the topic already on my channel, but that seemed a bit much. That was kind of the focus of our content last year, uh, towards the end of the year, when everything was getting shut down. Uh, and I don't think we should quite go into that much detail um, this year. Uh, so instead, you know, I just wanted to give you a nice summary of all the information um, that I know and that I think is important on the topic. So with that in mind, let's jump right in. So I'm going to call this presentation COVID Summary, What, Where, When, Why, and How. And I'm not going to completely follow this uh, format in terms of question by question, but it, basically, I want to try to answer any questions that you might have about coronavirus in this video and really just give a summary of everything that we know about it. So let's just start with COVID and what it is. Some of the confusion that I think arises around coronavirus and COVID and all that stuff is that there are a lot of different names for the same thing. Um, so COVID and COVID-19 and coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 are all basically the same thing. So any of those terms basically means the same thing. Um, there are some technical differences. For example, COVID and COVID-19 are the technical name for the disease that is caused by the virus, coronavirus. And technically, coronavirus is a, the name of a family of viruses. So there are lots of different types of coronaviruses. However, there's only one kind of type of this particular coronavirus, which is called SARS-CoV-2, and COV stands for coronavirus. So that might help you clarify a few things, but what is a virus exactly? And here we can say it's a, a life form that does not have cells or consume food, so it doesn't have a metabolism. And I think there could be a debate whether or not a virus is actually alive. I think it is alive. It definitely reproduces and, and spreads. Um, kind of like a life form would, um, but it, it does not have cells. It's tinier than uh, a cell. It's tinier than even the smallest cell of a bacteria. Um, how small is it? Uh, if you can think of the smallest mark on a ruler, that is a millimeter, and you could fit about 10,000 coronaviruses into one of the tiniest little marks on your ruler. So pretty, pretty small. Um, and so how do viruses live if they're not made of cells or if they don't somehow eat food uh, for energy? And the answer to that is that they essentially hijack and uh, infect other cells and use the cell, other cells to make more viruses. And we'll describe that process. So how does a, a virus go about hijacking a cell? And so we have a nice little diagram here on the right side. Um, and we kind of have four general steps to our viral cycle. Uh, the first step is that this, the virus does something called bind to a cell. So basically, this is our virus up here. And this is our cell. And so the virus kind of has to come on here and attach to the cell. And that's what we mean by bind to it. And I'll describe a little bit about that uh, later on in the lecture. Uh, so once it binds to the cell, then it injects what's called DNA into the cell. And as a reminder of sort of biology, DNA and also RNA, um, those should ring a bell. Those are essentially a recipe for a life form. Uh, you know, you probably recall in biology the A, C, T, G stuff and and uh, copying those codes and all that stuff. And what those codes are is basically a recipe, uh, kind of like um, there is a digital code in your computer. Uh, there is a DNA code in your body and your digital code in your computer basically is 
creating the video game or the video or whatever that you're watching, the DNA code in a life form is essentially uh, creating the life form itself. Um, so what a virus does is it basically, the cell, your normal cells, if you didn't know, you're made of cells and each one of your cells has DNA and it's human DNA, it's your DNA, and it's basically a recipe to make you. What the virus does is it injects its own DNA into the cell, and that's step two here. You can see this little blue squiggly line is the viral DNA, and basically it puts its own recipe in your cell. Your cell doesn't know that there's different DNA in it, and it begins basically reading the recipe, and the recipe is for making new viruses. And so that's step three down here. So you can see that the cell doesn't realize what it's doing, but because this viral DNA is in it, and the viral DNA is a recipe to make more viruses, the cell accidentally starts making more viruses. And that's, it's building viruses. And eventually, kind of four and five is that so many viruses uh, build up in this cell that the cell basically dies and all the viruses are released out of the cell to go infect more cells. And so slowly these viruses just try to take over every cell in your body to make more viruses. Now our particular virus is a little bit special in its way to get in and out of the cell. So our virus doesn't actually have to kill the cell, COVID, uh, it does not have to actually kill the cell to get out of the cell. It does something called endocytosis. And basically what happens is this is our, this is the coronavirus right here. So this is COV. And it sticks onto the cell. And then basically the cell membrane, that's this layer here, kind of wraps around it and takes it into the cell wrapped in its own nice little cocoon. And then once it's in there, it's kind of protected from anything that might be trying to uh, damage it. Uh, and then it can, it's free to kind of release its DNA into the, into the cell. That's what it's showing here. And it can also leave the cell the same way. So instead of all these viruses just having to be uh, packed into um, the cell and then the cell explodes and it kills the cell, we actually can slowly release a lot of viruses into the body without actually killing the cell. So we can keep the cell going uh, for a while and, and just let the same cell keep churning out more and more viruses before maybe your body even feels sick is the, the crazy part. Uh, a little different. Something that we don't quite know yet about the coronavirus is that there's also something called lysogenic viruses rather than lytic viruses. And lysogenic viruses, uh, an example would be something like herpes. These are viruses that basically once their DNA is released into the cell, it can kind of work its way into the nucleus sometimes and it will kind of hide out in there for who knows how long. And basically, this is what you would call maybe a dormant virus. So the viruses that cause things like warts and herpes sores, those are dormant in your body. They never go away. Uh, they're kind of hiding out in here, uh, just waiting for the right time to release out. And we're not entirely sure if coronavirus is such a virus yet. There are coronaviruses in the world that do behave this way. Um, and that is still a question with this one. Okay, so something else that is important to know about uh, when you're discussing uh, coronavirus or reading any articles or listening to the news about it is a concept called antibodies. So antibodies are a, a enormous part of everybody's immune system. And if you don't know what an immune system is, your immune system is essentially the various things in your body that help protect you from things that want to do you harm. So viruses and bacteria and fungus, anything that's trying to kill your cells, damage your body, that's what your immune system is there to protect you from. And antibodies are a pretty important component of that. Basically what they are, are tiny little proteins that are made by special cells, and their job is to stick to viruses. They basically bind to the virus and block it from getting to your cells. So for example, what as this COV virus is coming and it wants to attach to your cell, it attaches to something called a receptor on the cell's outside. 
And so it's kind of like a lock and key mechanism. So the virus kind of has a key, we call a key receptor, and it can bind to your cell and kind of unlock your cell to let it in. That's kind of what's going on right here. So what a antibody does is basically it's a little uh, thing that kind of plugs up this key and prevents it from binding to your cell. So your antibody would come in here and stick right to this little thing and sort of block it off. Usually they're kind of Y-shaped and block it off so that this virus can no longer actually stick to the cell. And basically the virus is no longer active at that point and will just slowly sort of die. Usually it gets gobbled up by another part of your immune system. So that's what these antibodies do. They come in and they stick to all of these little receptors on the outside of the virus and prevent it from binding to your cells. So the thing about antibodies is that you don't have them right away. Uh, your cells kind of have to study the virus. This is a new virus, nobody's ever had it before. And so your cells kind of have to study the virus and try to figure it out before they can make antibodies. But once you can make antibodies, generally you are immune to a virus, at least for some amount of time. Um, and that amount of time is not well understood for this virus. We think it's at least three months. All right, so speaking of antibodies, uh, there's also obviously a lot of news uh, about vaccine these days, vaccines these days, and vaccines work off of antibodies. So the normally when you get sick from a new virus, uh, your body has to kind of study it to make these antibodies to defeat it. Uh, what a vaccine tries to do is give your body kind of a jump start to that process. So basically, a vaccine can cause your body to produce antibodies against a pathogen, and a pathogen is just some kind of disease causing uh, microbe uh, without having to get sick. And the way this works is that you inject yourself usually with an inert virus. So an inert as an inactive virus. So you basically inject yourself with dead viruses and the dead viruses don't have the DNA that can infect you, but they have this outer shell still intact. And so the idea is that if you inject yourself with this dead virus that has these um, outer binding proteins still intact, the keys that unlock your cells, your body can study that dead virus, create antibodies for it, and then you're ready for the real virus in the real world. Usually this isn't 100% effective, but it can, uh, it can reduce the spread of a virus considerably. Um, and this is how a flu vaccine or a flu shot works each year. Okay, so let's get more into what COVID actually does to you and your body if you are infected with it. Uh, we know that COVID can bind uh, to your cells and can slowly release more viruses and slowly take over your cells. And yes, uh, COVID can also get to a point where your cells are making so many viruses that they do eventually just burst out and kill the cell. So COVID is a little bit more complicated than other viruses because the receptor that it binds to uh, this thing on your the edge of your cells that this virus sticks to is actually really, really important to your body. It's really, really common, basically anywhere you have blood in your body, which is pretty much everywhere. So uh, the co coronavirus binds to what we say is the ACE2 receptor of human cells. And you can see that right here. That's the little thing that it sticks to on your cell. Um, and... These are pretty much everywhere in your body, uh, in particular blood vessels. And so we say that COVID is a respiratory disease. That means that it infects your lungs. Um, and primarily that is what happens to most people that get it. And that's part of the reason why when it infects your lungs, it causes irritation and makes people cough and that helps spread it more. Uh, but it's also what we would consider an endothelial virus. And endothelial refers to these blood cells, sorry, blood vessel cells. And what I mean by blood vessel, those are arteries and veins. 
So anywhere in your body with arteries and veins, obviously the outside of those arteries and veins are lined with cells, and those are endothelial cells. It just so happens that your lungs are really, really full of these endothelial cells as well because there's a lot of blood in your lungs, and so your lungs are really full of these ACE2 receptors. So one thing that COVID can do is that basically it, it does really well in, in lung cells. So it can bind to them and get into lung cells and take over lung cells and make a lot of more viruses in lung cells. And in the process that can damage the cells and people can develop what's called pneumonia from that. And pneumonia is basically when you have a lot of dead cells and sometimes even bacteria. So bacteria are just, just kind of grow everywhere on your body all the time and usually they're pretty harmless but if there's a lot of dead cells then they have a lot of food and they can uh, begin reproducing and taking over and, and actually starting to harm you um, you also have dead immune cells uh, so those are your own cells from your immune system things like antibodies and the cells that make them uh, blood and water all these things begin piling up in your lungs as this battle between the virus and your body and bacteria all kind of play out and basically, when too much of that fluid builds up in your lungs, uh, we call that pneumonia. And what happens is that your lungs are designed to get oxygen from the air and put them into your blood so that you can survive. And if too much junk gets into your lungs, uh, for lack of a better word, you have difficulty breathing and you can eventually die of what's called respiratory failure because your lungs stop working, your body stops getting oxygen, and that's that's it. Um, if you ever hear of people that go on ventilators, or that word ventilator, these are people whose lungs aren't really capable of functioning anymore, and it's kind of a last ditch effort to keep them alive for a while as the body tries to fight off the virus. So it's a way to, to increase the amount of oxygen getting into somebody, even if their lungs are no longer capable of kind of breathing in and out. So you kind of take over breathing for the patient with a ventilator. Some other effects of the coronavirus besides respiratory failure and, and pneumonia, not everybody gets that, um, is that it basically seems to block the normal functioning of this ACE2 receptor. Okay, so let's talk about what this receptor is supposed to do in your body. So remember, this is just the ticket for COVID to get into your cells. It's, it's the lock that's sort of the COVID unlocks the, and provides the key for it to kind of open up in, into your cell. All right, so normally if you, your body doesn't have any COVID in it, there are other things in your body that will unlock this receptor and it's supposed to carry out a purpose for your body. So basically there's an enzyme in your body that's supposed to carry out a function that binds to this receptor. And when it binds to the receptor, it reduces inflammation and clotting in your blood. And inflammation is basically swelling. If you've ever seen something get kind of like red, like if you've uh, ever gotten a bruise or any kind of injury and it gets, um, it swells up and gets really red, that's inflammation. And clotting is, is what happens when you get something like a cut and the blood turns hard and turns into a scab. And so what normally happens is that you have an enzyme that binds to your cell that prevents inflammation and clotting from happening normally. But what can happen is that COVID comes in and binds to that same receptor. And so instead of not having inflammation or clotting, now all of a sudden you do have inflammation and clotting pretty much all over your body. Uh, that can be what happens. And this inflammation can, is what leads to one of the most common symptoms of COVID. So one of the first things that people with COVID say they lose, uh, that happens to them before they get a fever, they have a cough or anything like that, is that they will lose their sense of smell and taste. And apparently what happens is that the virus binds to cells in somebody's nose and causes a lot of inflammation. And it's not exactly like snotty, it just sort of so much fluid swells up into the nose that it blocks the ability to smell. 
And so you don't really know what's happening. I had a, a friend that actually had COVID and he said he was eating Domino's pizza and he was like, man, this is like the worst tasting pizza ever. <laughs> and he's like, man, it's just so bland. It doesn't taste like anything. And then the next day he felt a little worse and nothing was tasting like anything either. And then he put it together that he had COVID. So that would be one of the very first symptoms is if things just taste off, that could be a sign that you are in the early stages of, of COVID. Um, it can also lead to things like multi-organ inflammatory syndrome. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. Um, basically, the cell is active throughout your body and it's causing inflammation because the cells that are normally activated by this enzyme are now all blocked off by COVID viruses. And so inflammation just kind of runs amok and people have rat breakout and rashes and all kinds of swelling. And that can potentially be dangerous, you know, normally for your body to function kind of like your, your cells in your nose, if you have a lot of swelling and inflammation going on, uh, things might not function properly. Uh, I know some football teams in college have, have shut down because they noticed that the players that had COVID, they might not feel all that bad um, or feel all that sick, but they were noticing lots of inflammation in, in organs like the heart. It's called myocarditis. And, you know, even if you're feeling okay, if you have a lot of inflammation in your heart, your heart's all swollen up, swollen up and injured, kind of like that. You know, it's probably not a good idea to go be playing, you know, football and running around a lot. So I think I think it was the Big Ten kind of canceled their season over this news, um, which I think is pretty wise. We, there's still a lot we don't really know about this virus. Uh, so it can also cause strokes and heart attacks. Um, we definitely have some data on that now. Um, so the thing about clotting is, is when your blood begins to harden, when that is outside of your body on a scab, that's one thing. But when that's inside your body, those little um, clots will be flowing around and sometimes they can get stuck and actually block the uh, blood from flowing properly through arteries and veins. And that's what happens with heart attacks and strokes. So basically a stroke is when part of your brain uh, gets blocked off and blood can't flow to it. And that does damage brain damage to you and a heart attack is when parts of your heart are cut off from blood and your heart runs out of oxygen and that can also kill you so um you know all of these things are very serious that brings us to okay well like who is this serious for and why so this is the um breakdown of, of covid deaths for a country south africa when it was pretty early on in its uh, epidemic there um and I would say we see similar patterns in most countries. This just happened to be the graph that I can pull offline fastest. And basically what we see is that um, this is the number of deaths that have happened by age group. And you can see that if you're talking less than 30, uh, there have been hardly any deaths uh, from people that are younger than 30. It's not impossible, but it's pretty rare. And Basically, as we go up the age group, we see that more and more people are are dying from it, uh, with the, the peak being that most people that have died were between 60 and 69 in South Africa. Uh, then we notice that it does go decrease. Um, that is not because the virus is less deadly to those uh, individuals that are 70 and above, but there are just not as many 70, 80, and 90-year-olds in South Africa uh, than there are 60 to 69-year-olds and 50 to 59-year-olds. So actually, the death rate does increase with age um, for coronavirus. And usually when people die, it's from respiratory failure. Uh, but it can be things like strokes and blood clots as well. Um, so what we see is that and this was also pretty early on in the epidemic. Uh, we had some data from South Korea, Spain, China, and Italy. These numbers have probably changed a bit, but I think they're not bad still. Um, so this was one of the earlier graphs that was created. And what they found is that the death rate for those um, from zero to 40 or zero to 50 was less than 1%. Uh, by a pretty good margin. And basically, the older you get, the more deadly it is. Um, but 
to people from zero to 30, again, it was just not, not very deadly. Um, considerably deadlier than the flu to people in these age categories. Uh, right here, you can see something like 0.2%, and that doesn't sound, so that means that something like one out of 500 people that got it uh, would die. Um, you know, that's not insignificant. Uh, the true death rate might be a little bit lower than that for the 20 to 29 uh, year old category. It might be about that. Um, so that is low uh, compared to some other diseases, but it's actually pretty high compared to really abundant uh, contagious diseases like the flu. I mean, that's considerably higher. I, usually the flu is going to be less than 0.1% uh, for somebody of that age, considerably less. Um, and then what we see is that basically as we get older, the death rate increases um, all the way to over 10% for somebody that's 80 or older. Um, so that would mean that one out of every 10 80-year-old that gets it uh, will unfortunately pass away. So people that are um, older than 50, the death rate is considerably higher than 1%. All right, so let's move on to our last few questions here, is, which maybe you're wondering is, where did this come from? Maybe you're, you're vaguely familiar with the idea that, it's come, that it came from China, uh, but basically, like, where did this come from and, and how did it happen? Why did it happen? Um, so, yes, the virus did come from, from China. Uh, it came from a place called the Hubei province, and you might have heard of the city. Wuhan is a, a city inside this um, Hubei province. And the Hubei province is pretty densely populated. So I, I looked at the numbers. I think it's, it's about one-third the size of Texas, but it's got about twice as many people. So that you can see that that would be a pretty densely populated area. Um, Though it's pretty densely populated, there are still some forested regions uh, around. So these are both pictures from the Hubei province. So you can see there is some forest uh, mixed in through the, uh, throughout the cities. Where in particular we think in the Hubei province this disease came from was something called zoonosis. And so zoonosis is when an animal disease spreads to a human. And zoonosis will be a word that we talk about more over the course of the year. And it probably will not be the last time that this is a very important word in all of our lives. It's actually really, really common. So there are a lot of zoonotic diseases. For example, um, HIV uh, was a zoonotic disease, uh, came from hunting chimpanzees uh, over 100 years ago. Um, Ebola, SARS, um, rabies, there's a lot. Even certain types of the flu come from pigs and birds. You might have heard of swine flu, that's pigs, and bird flu, that's obviously birds, or avian flu, avian influenza. So they're really, really common, and we don't necessarily do a very good job of preventing this from happening. And we think in particular that this coronavirus, COVID, came from what's called a wet market which is a market where basically live animals are sold or fresh dead animals are sold. So the animals are butchered on site and sold. And in a lot of Asian markets, kind of exotic animals are sold uh, for food and for medicine. Um, for example, one suspect for this virus, where it came from, is this little guy here. This is called a pangolin. And pangolins are sort of like armadillo looking creatures. They have these little outer shelly bodies, but they are traded and eaten in some parts of the world. And we actually find some coronaviruses in pangolins that are similar to the coronavirus now currently uh, ravaging the world. Um, some people have pointed out that this is perhaps a little bit of poetic justice uh, of nature kind of getting back at us. Um, for doing this kind of stuff. Uh, another prime suspect and, and the leading suspect now is bats. Um, in some parts of the world, bats are eaten, uh, like you see here. Um, bats are also just really uh, around a lot. So uh, bats fly over everything. Uh, they fly over places where you have farms and you have farmland. And so 
bats come into contact with people. So that's another possibility is that maybe the bats weren't actually being eaten in one of these markets, but were just sort of present. Uh, regardless, we're pretty certain that the virus came from animals. And the reason for that is that it's happened all the time. Um, and just to give you some perspective on viruses and animals, so uh, viruses are unbelievably common in nature. And if you, we, we scientists have actually researched this and they've looked and they've tried to look all over the globe for as many mammal species as they could find. And mammals are things with fur, produce milk. Uh, and there are about 5,000 mammal species in the world. However, when they start trying to estimate how many viruses actually live in all of these animals, these mammals, they think there is about 320,000 mammal viruses. So each mammal species has something like 60 or 70 different viruses that can uh, grow and infect their bodies and their cells. And it just so happens that pretty much all 320,000 of these that are compatible with mammals uh, could conceivably be compatible with a human. Uh, most of them are not, and most of them are out in the woods somewhere, and, you know, they never come in contact with humans, and that's where it needs to stay. Um, but every once in a while, with practices like this, where you're bringing animals out of the woods and you're coming in close contact with them, these viruses can jump over. The really crazy thing about viruses is that actually if we look at all the different types of species of not only mammals, but reptiles and birds and amphibians and fish, uh, there's a whole bunch of those. And if we're adding plants, fungi, algae, and bacteria, all of which have their own viruses, um, the total number of viral species, types of different viruses in the world, could be as high as in the billions, billions with a B. Um, so viruses by far, they don't get a lot of attention in biology, and we only really think about them when they're infecting our bodies, but actually viruses are the dominant life form on Earth. If, we just total, if we're going by the total uh, t number of different types of viruses, if we're going by the count of viruses, it's just unbelievable how many viruses are actually in the world. Uh, the number is 10 to the 31, which is a one with 31 zeros behind it. That's how many viruses we estimate are currently living in the ocean, ready to infect whatever cells they might come upon. Uh, that might be a plankton, that might be a fish, that might be a plant, that might be anything. Viruses can infect all those things. Uh, how many viruses are in the air? That's a 10 to the 24, or a one with 24 zeros behind it. Uh, that's unbelievable numbers of viruses. And the really insane thing is that if you count all of these viruses, the total number of viruses, not how many different types, but just how many number of viruses there are, um, there are actually more viruses on planet Earth than there are stars in the known universe. There are huge numbers of stars out there. Unbelievable how many stars are out there, but there are more viruses on Earth than there are stars in the known universe. So those are some virus facts. And really, if we're trying to get to this ultimate question of, you know, why did this pandemic happen? Why did the coronavirus happen? It's a lot of different things, but it's all environmental science. Um, we know all these viruses are out there in the world, and we know that some of them are potentially compatible with the human body and that can do us a lot of harm. And so something like deforestation, uh, our, our top picture and our, our bottom left picture, where we are constantly as humans moving deeper and deeper into these jungles and wooded areas and displacing the animals so that now the animals maybe have to live on our farm or live in our cities. And at the same time, we are growing millions and millions of animals like pigs and cows and chickens and harvesting them and coming in close contact with them. Sometimes in markets where they're actually still alive and people are moving around them and buying them and butchering them, you are just creating a system where it's almost guaranteed that every few decades you're going to get a new virus that spills into humans. And 
a lot of times these viruses, it's kind of a dead end. They don't really spread human to human very well. You can look up a virus called Nipah virus, and that's a virus that came from bats and spread into pigs in Indonesia and Malaysia back in the 90s. And they had to kill like millions and millions of pigs just to deal with this virus. Um, and it did infect some people that were in close contact with the pigs and, and was extremely deadly. But luckily, that virus did not spread very well human to human. Uh, if it did, it would have been considerably worse than the current pandemic that we are experiencing right now. So ultimately, what we're looking at is, is we have not really designed a world that is very virus proof. The really sad thing to think about is that once this pandemic is over, which probably will be a long time, I mean, the most famous kind of recent pandemic was the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic that killed millions of people in the world. Um, that pandemic lasted several years um, before it, it finally kind of petered out because so many people got infected. Um, it's possible the same thing will happen with this one. I mean, when we look at the map of where this virus is now in the world, um, where the darker areas are more abundant, um, we can see that it's everywhere. And the idea that a vaccine or a treatment is going to get distributed to everybody on planet Earth in any reasonable amount of time, uh, I think is overly optimistic. And again, even once it's over, there's probably the scenario, we haven't really changed anything about any of these systems. I mean, we're still doing all this stuff in the world. So the idea that that's going to be the end of the story is 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 not likely. There's probably going to be future pandemics every few decades or so. All right. So, I mean, that can kind of make you feel a little bit helpless, but there are some measures that you can take uh, to try to prevent and slow the spread of COVID, and that's really all you can do. I mean, I feel pretty power, powerless, I'll admit, most days uh, living in the modern world. Um, but one thing that I have the power to do is to reduce the spread of the virus. And even if the virus doesn't do me much harm, it might do the person I infect more harm. And, you know, you have to look at the idea that you are responsible for the lives of all of your neighbors and all of your loved ones and all your family and friends. And if you take that attitude, I think, you know, we can get through this okay. If everybody took that attitude, we would definitely get through this okay. But unfortunately, right now, that doesn't seem to be how things are working out. Um, but the virus is airborne. Um, one way or another, uh, there's, there's some scientific discussion of if the airborne, if the virus is truly airborne or if it resides in something called a respiratory droplet, and a respiratory droplet, uh, the easiest way to describe that is this stuff over here. So basically when you sneeze and all that little bits of snot and saliva and water and virus goes everywhere, uh, those are respiratory droplets. And obviously those can go pretty far and they can float on the air for quite some time. Some of these are really, really small. Um, to be truly airborne, we say viruses don't even need those little respiratory droplets. They can just completely float around on the air all by themselves. Uh, it's unclear if this virus is truly airborne or if it's just spread by these little droplets. But either way, it's spread by things like coughs and sneezes and talking and even breathing. Uh, and that is why masks are so important. Um, so a mask is not a way... Most masks that are made and that are worn by people, aren't the, the filter on them is not small enough to actually filter out a tiny little virus. However, it could... Um, filter out some of these respiratory droplets that are considerably bigger than viruses and that could be kind of carrying the viruses. And that brings up the, the idea of viral loads. Um, you can kind of ask yourself the question, you know, would I rather be infected with a big old glob of snot this big that is full of a billion viruses and have that go into my lungs? Or would I rather be exposed to one single virus that is floating on the air that happens to make it through my mask? You would rather be infected by just one virus rather than a whole bunch because having that high, what we would call a viral load, 
which is a whole bunch of viruses getting in your body at once, which could overwhelm the system. If you're exposed to one, two, you know, 10 viruses at a time, uh, that might not be too big a deal for your virus, for your body to handle. And so that could be something that a mask could also help you do. Uh, if somebody coughs or sneezes in your vicinity, instead of getting a million viruses in your lungs, you might only get 10. And that gives your body an opportunity to make, um, to mount uh, an immune response and deal with the virus instead of being completely overwhelmed. So that is an idea that's being discussed that even if masks aren't perfect, they might actually still help you. It might help um, prevent you from getting a, a bad uh, bit of the disease. And then if you actually have the virus and there can be a little time window in there, uh, a day or two where you're not feeling all that sick, but you do have the virus in your body and you are maybe capable of spreading it to others, uh, unintentionally and accidentally by breathing on them or talking to them. If you have a mask on, um, fewer of those globs of little virus globs, uh, the respiratory particles are going to be getting out and launching out of your mouth. And maybe even fewer are making it through your person that you're talking to's mask. And then that, that helps reduce uh, the severity of the infection as well. So masks, definitely wear masks. Uh, Yes, please, please, please. Uh, distancing uh, is important also. Uh, the farther away you are from this guy that's sneezing, if you're really, 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 really far away, like 20 feet away, well, probably none of these big sneeze particles are going to land on you. If you're right up in his face, then obviously that's going to be bad. You're going to get millions of viruses on you. So the idea is that the further away you are, the better off you are as well. So that's called distancing. Okay. And the last thing to kind of be on the lookout for is what we would call fomite transmission, which fomite is a fancy word for surfaces. So basically this guy sneezes and some of these land on, you know, a table and just sit there. And apparently this coronavirus is really good at just sitting there and lying dormant for, depending if it's a cold room, might be a day or two. And so the idea is that you come by and you touch this table that this guy sneezed on two days ago, and now the virus is on your hand. And if you touch your face, say you pick your nose or you scratch your eye, or, uh, there is a chance that the virus can get into your body that way as well. So basically, you need to be frequently washing your hands. And most importantly, don't touch your face. I, I caught myself today, I'll admit. Uh, <laughs> I was at at school today and I, I touched the door handle and then I got in my car and I caught myself, you know, picking my nose and I went, oh crap. So I, that absolutely could have uh, been on that surface. And it, had I washed my hands or had hand sanitizer or just been more conscious of what I was doing, uh, hopefully I don't have it. Uh, that was pretty minor, but it can be that easily uh, that you could get the coronavirus. So just be careful on, on those fronts. All right. So, um, you know, that was a lot of information, and hopefully I did an okay job kind of explaining um, what the coronavirus is, what it does to your body, who is, uh, what kind of age groups are at the biggest risk factor. Obviously, it's over 50 years old. Um, where it came from and why it happened. And um, hopefully you feel more informed right now, and that can kind of inform your practices moving forward. Feel free to pass on this information to your friends, family, anybody. Um, I, I think the truly kind of best defense against something like this is actually, you know, knowledge and information. Uh, if everybody kind of understands and gets on the same page, I think we can deal with this a lot better than if everybody's kind of doing their own thing and not listening to experts in science. Anyway, take it easy. Have a good one.